thank you, Fabiola, again for your presentation, for your introduction. And um, I thanks everybody for joining. I also see some known faces, so it's good to to see this virtual space of friends and other people that are interested in my talk. Um, I'm very pleased to be one of the first the first to talk in this uh, uh, Momo lecture, and uh, and also. Is a weird but exciting experience to talk in a virtual uh, mode about mobility. Uh, maybe getting a bigger audience than otherwise, and uh, probably to greater distances. Um, I think it's very interesting for me doing studying my mobility issues, uh, and for everybody here present. Um, I would like, in this regard, to start from the very picture of the mo this mobile lecture poster. A picture that I took years ago at Heathrow Airport in London um, was a, was a, while I was waiting for my plane to take off. This picture is evocative, uh, I think, in various ways. For one thing, it portrays the, an airport, what Mark Auger has called a known place, uh, a transit place in which, according to Auger, identity, history, and relation do not really make any sense. These places are also, these kind of places are also symbolic in a way of the assumption that our world is entered in an accelerated mode, that we are all on the, in the, on the move. And uh, uh, with also the boundary breakings that characterize globalization and the form, as the format of this lecture also indicates the digital world. Uh, it's quite interesting to think that now today is the 9th of November and is the date of the break of one of the uh, one among the most symbolic boundaries in history, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, migrants, we know, refugees, business people, students, academics, journalists, tourists and pilgrims, artists also, to, just to name a few, are those who move and we see moving, but also, also commuters, walkers, drivers, delivery workers. However, as we know, not everyone can move in the same way, under the same condition and at the same velocity. This seems especially true in these current times of pandemic, when boundaries of different kinds are being reshaped and blurred or reinforced at the same time. And what, as Noel Salazar recently noted a couple of weeks ago at the annual uh, John Henry lecture, patterns of who, what, when and where moves have been changing. Again, as Noel Salazar put it, not all movements are equally meaningful and life-shaping. Not all forms of movement automatically imply mobility. It is when movements intertwines with meanings, identity, norms, imaginaries, and I think we change, that it stops being physically, uh, simply physical motion and becomes what in the social sciences is no mobility. It is the fact that we value, I think, make sense of the change that the movement might bring about and what is said as to remain the same that determines the significance of mobility as a human experience. But what is this change all about? What does it mean, if at all? Um, the idea of mo mobility embodies the idea of moving towards something, the expectation, aspiration, and I think the refusal also of change. The value of mobility as change is certainly part of, part of a wider social and cultural value system. Geographical mobility often is viewed as essential to move up economically, socially, professionally, symbolically, or even existentially. Migrants, for example, can move in search of a space appropriate for progressing in their lives. Along with something wrong here, sorry. Okay. Yes. Along with Gas and H, they are looking for a space and a life where they feel they are going somewhere as opposed to nowhere, or at least a space where the quality of their goingness is better than what it is in the space they are leaving behind. Noel Salazar's momentous uh, mobilities observe that mobilities become momentous for the very fact that the accumulated experience of travel can be used later in life to facilitate future mobilities. They can answer what has been called by Kaufman the motility, the person's capacity and potential to move. Mobility is also valued as uh, it can turn into some forms of capital, like social, symbolics, but also what Haidt called cosmopolitan capital, the capacity and desire to expose oneself to social cultural diversity. This picture, I think, also portrays a moment of weight during travel. 
A simple act like waiting at the airport represents just one among the most many possible immobilities, immobilities we can think of. It has been a lot accepted from scholars uh, uh, in the mobility, mobility paradigm, the fact that the experience of mobility is relational to immobility. The systems that sustain movement like an airport may require mobility, the massive infrastructure that organize the physical movement of people and, God, and goods, like suggested by Mimi Schiller and John Harry already a dec more than a decade ago. Or mobility can be both impeded and enabled by what Tim Creswell has called frictions, friction different from uh, uh, simply moorings like for Schiller and Harry, indicates an ambivalent stillness that both impedes, impedes and enables mobility. Peter Eide very well portrays the view from an aircraft waiting to take off and the illusion of the movement when looking at another aircraft nearby. As the other aircraft, aircraft gradually disappear out of our view, the feeling is that our aircraft is moving while it is in fact still. If we, think, if we think again about the current pandemic situation, a clear fact of this crisis is that while so, so, some could stay immobile, others have to continue moving. The mobility of some is contingent to the mobility of others and vice versa. People can be physically stopped by others while moving, like at the borders or by external causes. People can resist the idea of moving as they consider mobility an impediment to their life project. They can block or accept the idea of another person moving either as a barrier or as a resource to their personal life progress. Mobility is also composed of various tempos, velocities, and intensities, and is temporary, temporary oriented. A recent publication edited by Everett Amit and Noel Salazar entitled Pacing Mobilities, for example, particularly showed how the issue of power and agency inherent in the experience of mobility is not simply a matter of choices between going or staying or different or between different destinations. According to Amit and Salazar, indeed, people are, are as attracted by the pacing that they attribute to places and journeys as by the location of, of destination or routes. Immobility is multiple. It can be made of those special points through which the movement passes, slowdowns and might stop like borders or can be very constraints that block the capacity to move, or a person's decision, aspiration to stop or to slow down. It can be relating to a person's self stankness while act actually being on the move. If we lend full credit to the immobility itself as a concept, its temporal, symbolic, and uh, special dimensions, we could agree with David Bissell and Gillian Farrell when they say that immobility does not just enable or constrain mobility, Immobility rather simply being the, is not simply the opposite of mobility, but represents a specific engagement with the word or to cite the Bissell and Farrell's words, within this relative immobility, things are not still at all. In immobility, there is a potential to be otherwise, to move otherwise while staying physically mobile. And here comes the title of my speech today, Traveling Without Moving, that is not an attempt to, to, to quote an album of Jamiroquai, but rather to shine a light on this potentiality of change in the experience of immobility. I propose exploring this potentiality through the analytical lens of liminality. And here comes the book uh, that Fabiola just presented. Liminality, as many of you might know, is a concept developed, developed in anthropology by Van Gennep to study the structure of rituals. The most classic representation of a liminal event are those life events uh, that mark a person's change in state, like re reaching the adult age or giving birth, or in status, getting married or becoming a citizen, for example. The liminal, the liminal is the phase of passage of this rendition, or as Victor Turner late, later perfectly defined it, the time and space betwixt and between one concept of context of meaning, action, and another. A scholar across the social science recently gave the concept of liminality, uh, I think, an ontological and wider sociopolitical magnitude. Liminality is not simply embedded within ritual processes but come to be viewed as a going through experience. With a, with a, when a certain state of things or limits that usually constitute our lives are still the same across time, is for some reason suspended by being transformed into something else, even for a brief moment. 
Liminality as a concept is useful not only to identify the relevance of an in-between period, but also to understand how human experience change. Uh, Nelson Grabun, for example, in, in the gates indicate a first connection between mobility and liminality when comparing the structure of a journey to the everyday ritual sequence of our life. Life is the succession of events marked by change in state. It is both cyclical in that the same time marking events occur day after day, year after year, and it is progressive or linear in that we pass through life but a series of changes in status, each of which is marked by a different from similarly structured rite of passage. An almost universal motive of the for the explanation and description of life is the journey, for journeys are marked by beginnings and ends and by a succession of events along the way. Starting from the work of Victor and Eddie Turner on pilgrimage, scholars across the social sciences have already explored travel as a liminal experience. Travel can present the form of, once, of a once in a lifetime rapture, like in a case of migration, or a succession of events, at times repetitive, like in the case of daily commuting. And here, the, the, the connection between liminality and mobility of Grabun seems quite uh, interesting indeed. I believe, however, that it is in the suspension of normal patterns of things, the undoing of a previous situation and the potential for change, that we can find a first uh, connection, important connection between liminality and mobility. Travelers, by the very fact of traveling, go be, can go behind the here and now context of their everyday life, can escape the constraints of social expectations and can explore new social positions through the temporar temporariness of travel. At the end of the journey, these travelers return and have to account in one way or another for the expected change presumably occurred through traveling. These travels, travelers can be pilgrims, but also tourists, and transient, transient or privileged migrants. We live migration as an adventure, as observed by my colleague Brigitte Suter in her study on intracorporate expatriates in China. Other travelers might not return and can leave a sense of stuckness by being trapped uh, for example, at the borders, or by feeling caught in a limbo of permanent present. Mobility in, in this sense, I think, can also embody an idea of effort, loss, even danger. Andrew and Roberts in the liminal landscape reconceptualize liminal spaces in relation to danger, marginality, and the risk attached to certain spaces, like disaster zones or frontier zones, and the movement associated with this space, for example, dangerous tourism or illegal immigration. In these spaces, travelers' identity are threatened rather than positively transformed. We cannot always say if a change happens or not with liminality. We might temporarily evade, evade normative, com normative convention in liminality, but in the reintegration phase, everything might also go back to what it was before. Vera Damid, for example, showed how in the case of university exchanges and working holidays for young travelers, liminality limits possibility of transformation rather than creating them. These forms of travel are, are usually presented by the institutional actors as being significant, significant for the transition to adulthood. These youth experiences, however, do not finally conform to these normative discourses. Quite the contrary, they represent a temporal escape from adult responsibilities. Uh, the question, I think, is not whether a change finally happens or, happens or not, but as proposed by Bjorn Thomason, how human beings, experience, uh, human beings experience and react to change, how they live through the uncertainties of the in-between, and they come out on the other side of it, if at all. I suggest using the concept of liminal hotspot to understand what happens in between mobility and, mob and immobility, to analyze the ambivalence between the potentiality of a liminal experience and the fact that we don't know whether a change will happen or not at the end. A very common way of picturing a liminal hotspot is refugee camps or detention centers, where migrants are confronted with the limbo situation of not knowing what comes next, while being physically contained and might perceive the situation as permanent. The idea of hotspots in general, we know in the concept of migration relates to the wider system, political system that channels and controls the movements of migrants. A liminal hotspot, however, has been defined more broadly as a human condition of suspension, uncertainty, ambivalence related to being in, a, in the in-between phase of a transition. Such a condition derived from what Arpad Stakulsai conceptualizes as a permanent liminality. 
That is when the passage in transition feels like permanent, static, or as he put it, when the more things change, the more they stay the same. There is not a total reintegration in a limila outspond condition, different from a traditional limila passage, for example. We know what we leave behind, but we don't know what will be next and when. We are caught in the limbo situation on be both what we were and what we would be, we could be. And at the same time, we are neither, neither one nor the other, similarly to the betwixt and between condition of Turner's limila persona. A liminal hotspot manifests through the coexistence of different and at times conflicting meanings. It manifests through multiple temporal and dimension in place, the stuck present, the gum past, and the uncertain future. I propose that the condition of liminal hotspot emerges at the interplay of mobility and immobility, when usual patterns of movement, as people know it and practice it, are disrupted for some reason. I want to draw your attention to different but related experiences that I believe illuminates this condition. I explore mobility both from the point of view of those who move and those who do not move, but reflect on the movement of others. Important development, developments. Sorry. Important developments um, in the study of mobility are represented not only by the use of mobile methods, but also by the analytical perspective advancing migration studies exploring the absence of movement, the so-called stayers or immobile or left behind. And by an analytical approach to rather look at movements occurring at the semantic and temporal levels, like for, for example, imagination. I start with my past research on the cultural representation of the so-called Buraco culture in Japan. The Buraco minority refers to people who are discriminated against for their occupations, such as butchering, leatherworking, or street entertainment. As part of the research, I followed the performances of the Monkey Dance Company group, performing all our practice of monkey training across Japan, long discriminated for, for this very itinerant character. The art performance of the Monkey Dance Company follows a participatory and, met and mobile approach. As part of the, the itinerant style, these performers travel throughout the country um, to perform across all Japan. While traveling, the company slowdowns stops to look for a good spot to perform and invite people to interrupt their activities and join the show on the street. The traditional calling for, of the audience ritual entails the physical stop in front of the door of the spectator houses to invite them to join the show later. Immobility in the form of stops for trainers during the journey to perform and spectators to attend the performance is a significant aspect of this trainer's art. Through the deceleration in the lives of the spectators and the active participation in the show, as you can see in the, in the pictures, and through the constant conflict also between the monkey and the trainer, the monkey dance company tried to challenge normative social meanings also, and most importantly, regarding the Buraku issue. The constant change of the monkey's mood and the uncertainty of whether the monkey will do this as I said or not become the, very, become the very attraction of attraction of the performance. This must stay, maintain the audience in a, a continu continuous state of suspense, in a state of what has been called by Kofoed and Stanner, liminal affectivity, defined as a condition of potentiality for be af being affected and affecting events at the same time. This liminal affectivity is what makes spectators want to participate in the show, as they realize that their applause may change the course of the event and possibly contribute to the success of the performance. Victor Turner, in this regard, talked about performances in terms of subversion of structural orders. He explained many genres do not simply reverse or have, but also reinforce and justify prevailing orders. And this is the case of the Monkey Dance Company following a similar tactic. Artists challenge social meanings without taking them all enti over entirely. The buraku that is symbolized by the monkey is not buraku anymore for a moment, but yet not completely Japanese either. During the show, we hear the training talking about the monkey as a child, as an artist, inviting people to upload and reminding them at the same time that the monkey is an animal and therefore unpredictable. The monkey remains in a liminal hotspot, oscillating between being an animal and an artist, between being both animal and human, and neither an animal anymore, not yet a human. 
In this hotspot, the monkeys stop representing the buraco and for a brief moment enter into the realm of Japanese culture, only to go back to being what it, what it is and reinforce the specialness of the buraco opposed to the Japanese. The mastery of the performance performer in training the monkey is what keep the buraco special. The spectators cannot do the same as the trainer, cannot have the same relationship with the animal, cannot withstand the bites of the monkey. What is usually then perceived as an anomaly, the bites all over the arms or the ends of the trainer, but the monkey also acting as an animal, should not be removed altogether in this performance, becomes symbol eventually of specialness, skills, art, of an ambivalence surrounding the image of the monkey and by the extension of the buraco. This is the same kind of ambivalence I recognize in the main character of a movie of Claudio Giovannesi entitled At Lee Blue Eyes, after a poem of Pierpaolo Pasolini. I watched, I watched this movie in, the, in 2013 when I was conducting research in my hometown, Rome. It is, this is the story of Nader, a 16-year-old Italian-born boy, son of Egyptian parents living in the outskirts of Rome. Nader wears blue color contact lenses to look more Italian. His lens, lenses, like the blue eyes of Ali in the poem of Pausolini, can be viewed as a form of ambivalence, symbolically represented by the non-white migrant with blue eyes. I find interesting that I saw this movie in the same year I was carrying out research in a high school in Rome. The study was part of a larger research on the sense of diversity among children and young people, conducted at the Institute of Cognitive Sciences and Technologies of the Italian National Research Council. My colleague Camilla Pagani was also here in this virtual uh, room, and I and myself visited the pupils in their class classroom in a suburban Rome, known for being inhabited by many migrant communities. Without the presence of the teacher, we asked them to write about their opinions and feelings concerning the fact that people of different backgrounds live in Italy. The writing is considered here as the performance before as a liminal event. With our arrival that morning, we interrupted the normal flow of a typical school day. And like in a staged liminal event, we occasioned the specific experience for the pupils within the institutional context of the school to provoke a breaking out from structural roles of the school. And yet the very effect of being in the classroom while doing an extracurriculum activity put the pupils in an in-between position with the effective resonance that this position might bring. In the way this adolescent write, it emerges an ambivalence between being honest and at times use strong tones to describe negative emotions toward immigrants on the one hand, and conform to socially acceptable values and avoid negative judgments on the other. Other times they seem to struggle between the dominant discourses about migration that borrow from media, from adults or from their peers, and their more personal experience or the experience of a migrant friend or a relative. I referred before at the symbolic space represented by the blue eyes of Ali, as this is mirrored, I think, in the way this adolescent makes sense of migrants. As an example, I want to make the case of a 16-year-old girl called Georgia from my reading of an analysis of a, of a text written by another girl, I call, I call actually, I, I call instead Ilaria. Here you can find some pieces of this essay. She says, the attitude of most of these immigrants is awful. Um, like for example, it was 9 p.m. in summer, I get up the tram to go to have an ice cream with friends and I'm scared. A Bangladeshi man come closer and starts making advances to me. There is a friend of mine whom I will call here Georgia, who is from Bangladesh. She cannot have a smartphone. She cannot go out in the afternoon. She cannot have Italian friends. I cannot, have, I cannot even come to my place for studying. Her father thinks that his daughter is being corrupted by the ideals of our country. So I wonder, it is possible that a 16-year-old girl should live like in a prison. What's wrong with them is their attitude. According to my education, I think there are some ways of doing that are pretentious. If they come to Italy to work, to educate their children, be honesty and behave, they would be more than welcome. Later, she also talked about Ali, another friend, a 20-year-old guy who works in the mechanic workshop of my father. I think he's one of the most altruistic and kindest person in the world. He has been working for my father since a while already, and he, there is now a friendship relation. Georgia is the Bangladeshi friend of Ilaria. She comes to embody the very ambivalence of Ali with blue eyes. The personal conflicts that Georgia, as Ilaria described it, go through to, due to their family beliefs, 
seems to mirror Ilaria's tensions. While being effectively close to Ilaria, Georgia also incarnates the kind of diversity that appears to be too extreme, as defined by one pupil during our conversation in the classroom. The image of Georgia then typ typ typifies an in-between position between the generic Bangladeshi person who scares Ilaria and affects her movements across the city, and Ali, another friend who represents the good migrant. In Ilaria's words, Georgia, like other migrants, move from being different to being similar to Italians, only to return and once again become, become a migrant when different becomes too much to bear. The migrant, like in many other writings of these young people, comes to be both similar to and different from Italians, and neither completely the same nor completely different. Adolescents often depict the migrant friend as a good person who moves to another place seeking better opportunities and a good life. The emotional and moral proximity to a migrant friend helps move towards this, the point of view of the migrant in general. Some of these adolescents never experience migration themselves, other tells about the experience of a relative or a parent. While on the one side they fear the country may change and lose its cultural identity, on the other they complain about the socioeconomic mobility that Italy is going through vis-a-vis -vis the progress in migrants' life. Movement stasis, in this sense, happens in the semantic world in the way these adolescents make sense of themselves and others. This move, the movement above this geographical space then is distinct and not always parallel to what Alex Gillespie and others conceptualize as semantic movements. In further opposition to the geographic body, the semantic word enables us to move between and occupy many social, temporal and imagic geographic positions simultaneously and a really rapid sequence. At a semantic and psychological level, the past, present, and future can coexist along with counterfactual present, imagined past, and wished for or feared future. This, this jump to an unknown future through imagination is another relevant aspect that I want to highlight here. My recent studies in collaboration with the NCCR on the Move Force and the NCCR Lives Now, respectively, on the work transition of mobile professional partners and and quality of tight Syrian refugees in Switzerland focus both uh, on the experiences of immobilities for these migrants. Both the partners of mobile professionals on overseas assignment and qualified refugees and asylum seekers I met during my fieldwork come to face a rupture in their professional lives and the everyday rhythm and the difficulty in remaking a new one in the destination country. The qualification are not all always easily recognized, or the legal status, especially in the case of the refugees, can represent a further constraint. These migrants can experience a condition of suspension between their previous life, professional lives, to a worse situation that is not yet in place. From being professional and full-time employee before departure, they find themselves in a new temporal situation when they have, much, where have much more time, stay home, and have to wait. Mobility for these people can become then an experience of social, physical, or existential immobility. They can see no sign of progress in their career. They can feel stuck in the present where life seems to go nowhere. The experience of waiting for a new job or simply for the opportunity to work, like in the case of asylum seekers, becomes a liminal experience for these migrants who come to navigate meanings about professional, gender, and other identities across the past and present, their distance or proximity with others. I want to go back to the waiting of the Venetian slide. One may wait for something like an airplane to take off or wait out for something or an unwelcome situation to come to an end. Waiting out involves both a subjection according to age to the elements or to a certain social condition and at the same time embracing of these conditions. I follow David Bissell here in thinking that the waiting is not simply a slower, a slower rhythm that must speed up again. It is a being in the world marked by intentionality and by a person's potential capacity of making a decision of where to, where to wait and what to do while waiting. The experience of waiting becomes also a space for imagination where migrants could even simply picture an alternative life or alternative activities to progress in their career anyhow. The imagination and aspiration capacities are centrally affected by the circumstances these migrants live, including the role of others, who can be a working partners, local people, or workers at immigration institutions. The act of waiting for these individual moves, moves around the most subjective, imaginative wondering, what could I do otherwise? And the presence of others who might block the capacity to put into practice 
these ideas. Some men accompany the working female partner abroad for work, for example, quit their job and start taking care of children. At times, they come to imagine what they could do as an alternative job after a long time of a successful job search. However, they might hesitate to make a change in their life, prefer to wait for a less risky job opportunity to come. Their imagination is stopped the very moment these men are confronted with the gender, the image of the male breadwinner in the family, and with the negative feeling of seeing their partners as the only one who works in the family. Refugees in turn tell about their weight at home, their willingness to try and do something different to stay active, but also about the impossibility, according to social workers, to attend alternative training, build a new work profile, learn a new job. For imagining an alternative, they are put back in a situation of waiting for an, any job to come, even not at the level of their qualification. Mobility entails various experiences then, other than simple special movement, like the case, the case studies presented show. First of all, mobility leads to an encounter with other people or others' perspectives, and when one owns an other's potential transformation. The sense we associate with and around the experience of mobility is never constituted in isolation from others then. These encounters are important between immobile and immobile trajectories and an example of what and that thing called collaboration across disparance, encounter where boundaries of various kinds can be revisited altogether. <clears throat> to a certain extent, mobility for some can represent a space for self-exploration, self-reflexivity and imagination, not only for those who are considered as voluntary movers, as demonstrated by the case of tied pattern partners and refugees. Today, we are confronted with one of the biggest examples of societal liminal hotspot linked to the mobility and immobility of people and to the mobility of something more insidious like a virus. The pandemic crisis, as also recently suggested by Paul Stender and David Capozzi. As in a per as in permanent liminal situation, we know what things look like before. We don't know with what will happen when things will go back to normal again. If that normal would look like what we were used to, or this crisis will bring, will bring to a change. The pandemic brought our existential uncertainties to the extreme and led to the reconstitution of certain boundaries and thresholds, like simply the one, the, the intimate one of our homes or the big ones like uh, national borders was passing through comes now to be experienced differently somehow. The hotspot of the lockdown especially is an extreme case where like the waiting with tight partners <clears throat> or qualified refugees, something can potentially change or maybe not. I think about Quarantine Mood, a, search, a short movie of, by Alessandro Marinelli, documenting about what the director saw from his terrace during the lockdown in Rome, in one of the suburbs of the city. In the video, people pass time on the balcony while waiting for things to go back to normal. In the meantime, they engage with all kinds of activities like sitting, playing, kissing, dancing, even running or riding a bicycle, singing or uploading for the community. Liminality does not always bring change, let alone positive change. We cannot say if those were habitual or unusual activities for these people on the balconies on whether or not these movements in the immobility of the lockdown were meaningful and life shaping for them. A conceptual risk is to see liminality as being everywhere. However, I think that liminality is good to think with for ethnography, to borrow Vera Damit and Niger Records' word. Liminality, as Thomas Sen noted, helps understanding phenomena that are normally not analyzed as part of the same reality. Liminality can support in better understanding the paradoxes of mobility, the interplay between mobility and immobility, like the condition of permanent stuckness, a yet potential impasse described today. Um, this is especially important today, I believe, in a world where my mobility can represent an imperative or a synonym of progress for some, but oppressive a threat, for change, a threat of change for others, or even a disrupted event for those who do not move. Especially in a moment where we have the responsibility to address the inequalities of mobility and deal with the multiple immobilities to learn, to learn to live with the virus. Paradoxically, the richness of the concepts such as liminality lies precisely in the fact and risk that liminality could be everywhere. It is more than a lens for understanding ritual performances or out of the ordinary, ordinary experiences, like the one depicted by Thomason when exploring bumpy, bumpy jumping. 
Liminality can give us a sense of all those societal or subjective experiences that happen to us, disrupt the patterns and boundaries of our habitual mobilities, and make us detour also from what we have planned and imagined for. As Mimi Schiller noted a few weeks ago, again in the annual John Harry lecture, the pandemic disrupted our ways of moving and put us in front of new emergent temporal and material assemblages of mobility. How can we better understand these emergent mobilities? How can we better make sense of the uncertainties and mobilities of a transitional phase like the one we are going through now and maybe render permanent liminality more livable? I like a lot the image proposed by Paul Stenner and David Caposi of a song playing and then posing. We need to understand how it can be that a song playing after the pause may be different from that which was playing before. And for that, how the song we thought was playing before the pause can turn out to have been a different song all along. I think exploring the diversity of liminal experiences in mobility, or rather what I call liminal moves in my book, uh, can help understand how people deal with and make sense of studies, studies, uncertainty and change when confronted with the challenges of mobility. I think can help indeed understand how we remember the song as a matter of our life being before, how we think it has changed in the meantime and how it will probably continue playing after the pause. Thank you. <laughs>